Momentum. 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 Today we're we're going to be talking about something called momentum. I think momentum is a concept that a lot of people probably have already seen before, maybe even since high school physics, right? And as a reminder, if you have an, an object of mass m, which is moving at some velocity v, like such, then its momentum will be equal to the mass of the object m times v which is what well, basically just how quickly the object is moving and usually you denote momentum using the letter p so p equals mv like so and if you've done a little bit more advanced physics you realize that velocity v is actually a vector quantity so usually you put a little arrow to show that it's a vector and because v is a vector uh, the momentum will also be a vector quantity as well and again you put the same little arrow on the top of its head like that now there's also one other thing that you probably have also seen uh, when you talk about momentum which is that momentum in any system must be conserved well uh, what i mean by this is for example if i have this ball of paper and let's say i have this packet of ketchup and these two are colliding against each other and bouncing off each other right what you can do is you can work out the momentum before the collision so the ball will have some momentum uh, the packet of ketchup will have some momentum and they collide boop. and then after its collision the ball will still have some momentum so a different momentum and the packet of ketchup will also have some different momentum and if you work out the total momentum of the ball and the ketchup add the momentums together before the collision and then do it again after the collision what you'll find is that the total momentum must stay the same. It is conserved. The total momentum of the system is conserved. The question that I want to answer today is why is this the case? Because it seems really arbitrary that we've defined momentum to be mass times velocity. But the fact that we have defined it to be mass times velocity means there is a special property about it that makes it conserved in any physical interaction. And today, I want to demonstrate why that is the case. Now, before I actually go on to talk about conservation of momentum, I want to talk about something in classical mechanics that we're going to need later on. Specifically, I want to talk about something called Newton's three laws of motion, which some of you might remember from uh, high school physics or from some other videos that I've already done. Well, Newton's three laws of motion basically is sort of the, the core or sort of like an axiom to classical mechanics it is sort of the fundamental law behind well the whole field of classical and newtonian mechanics the first of these three laws basically says that if we have an object like this bottle of water and it's just staying there with no forces acting upon it nothing being done upon the object then the object will just stay like that or just stay still and nothing will happen to it Similarly, if the object is just floating in space with some velocity and nothing is done upon the object, it will remain moving at that same velocity or we'll just basically keep going into a straight line with the same speed. Well, the first law is basically just that, but we're not gonna really need the first law that much today. So I'm more concerned about the second and the third law of Newton. The second law of Newton talks about what happens when we actually do something to a moving object or a stationary object. So again, if I have a bottle of water maybe floating in space like this and I apply a force upon this bottle of water, what happens to it is it will start to move. Its speed will start to change. In other words, it will start to accelerate. And how much the bottle of water accelerates depends on the amount of force that I apply onto it and on the mass of the object that I'm applying the force onto. And specifically, the equation relating the force, the mass, and the acceleration is simply going to be F, the force I apply, will just be equal to the mass of the object that I'm applying the force onto times the acceleration that the object will undergo, F equals MA. And again, A is a vector and F is a vector, just in case you have seen uh, this form the equation before. So basically, if I have a ball of water like this and I apply a force onto it, I will cause it to accelerate. 
right? But if I have an empty bottle of water, the empty bottle of water has got, well, has got no water and the mass it has will be a lot less. So if you apply the same amount of force onto it, it will actually accelerate more. It, its speed will change much quicker because its mass is lower. This is basically summarized by a simple equation F equals M. Now Newton's third law basically talks about action and reaction forces. It basically says that for every action there must be an equal and opposite reaction. Basically if there is a force being applied from one object to another then in that system there must also be another force, a reaction force, which is going to be opposite in direction but equal in magnitude being applied from one object to the other as well. As an example, uh, Suppose we might look at this like there is, an, there is Earth and there is a moon, right? And we know that the Earth is going to be pulling on the moon by gravitational force. So the Earth will exert a force on the moon and there will be some force uh, being pull, pulling the moon in. But by Newton's third law, it also means that the moon must be pulling on the Earth as well. The moon is exerting a gravitational pull upon the Earth as well. And that force will be equal in magnitude but will be opposite in direction. In this case you can see it's opposite in direction because one is pulling on this way and the other force is pulling on this way. Now another way you can sort of see Newton's third law is by doing this experiment. Um, go up to a friend or your family member or a stranger, uh, maybe you're not a stranger because quarantine, uh, and basically just uh, hit them in the face, slap them in the face. and. Um, what you'll see, what you'll feel is that they will hurt their face, but at the same time, you'll also hurt your hand. And this is because of Newton's third law. Uh, so suppose this bottle of water uh, is uh, another person because I don't have any friends at the moment. Uh, if I slap the face of another person, what I'm doing is I'm applying a force onto their face, right? But because of Newton's third law, when I apply force onto someone else's face, it means that their face is also going to be pushing back against me. Well, basically, their face is going to be applying a force, an opposite force, back onto my hand. But this force will be equal in magnitude. So basically, when I hit them in their face, I apply force onto their face, which makes them hurt. But by Newton's third law, their face is also going to apply a force back onto my hand, which in turn will make my hand hurt. And you can see that this is true because if you hit your friend harder, your hands will hurt even more. Because when you hit them harder, you're applying more force onto them, but at the same time, their face is also going to apply more force back onto you as well. So that was the tour talking about Newton's three laws of motion, and we're going to be ready to discuss about momentum a little bit more now. So let's consider the following question first before we get into actual conservation of momentum, right? So suppose we have a rocket ship just cruising around in space like that. If uh, there is no force acting on the rocket, like we're not turning the engine on or whatever, then the rocket will just keep remain cruising at the same velocity, right? But suppose now we turn the engines on and then, right? What this will do is this will apply, exert a force upon the rocket ship, like so. It will cause the rocket to experience a force in the forward direction. And this force, because there is a force upon the rocket, the force will cause the rocket to accelerate or change in speed, right? So with a force applied on the rocket, turning on the engine, it will cause the rocket to go faster. Now suppose we apply this force we turn the engine on for some number of seconds, some amount of time. The question I want to ask is what is the change in momentum of the rocket? Okay, so let's consider that question. Uh, what we can do is we can draw pictures, right? So let's start by drawing uh, a rocket, which in this case I'm just going to use a block because I can't really draw, like so. And let's assume that the rocket has some mass of m just going to call it M because I'm, I'm, I, I can't think of another variable name. Now initially before we turn the engine on, right, it's going to have some velocity going into some direction and let's say this velocity is VI, basically initial velocity, I for initial, right. Uh, we can work out the momentum before we 
hit the engine, we turn the engines on, and the momentum, which I'm going to call PI, or initial momentum, will be equal to m, the mass of the rocket, times VI, or initial velocity. I am going to ignore vectors, I'm just going to treat everything as a scalar, like so. Now, after some amount of time t, which I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to say time equals to t, no, let's actually say delta t, right? Uh, just, just for notation purposes. And after some time delta t, this is the amount of time where we're hitting the engine and turning the engine on. And after this amount of time, we're going to have the same rocket, and we're going to assume the mass is going to stay the same. Um, we're going to say that this mass, this rocket, now moves at a new velocity. I'm going to say this velocity is Vf, or final velocity. Right. And again, we can work out this momentum. This momentum Pf, final momentum, is simply just going to be mvf, right? mass times final velocity. Now, what we want to find, I'm just going to write it down here, is we want to find what delta p is. And delta p is basically going to be equal to pi, no, sorry, pf minus p. I, right, the difference between final and initial velocity, which is going to be equal to m times vf minus m times vi, right, which I can factorize to be m vf minus vi, like so. Now, what else do we know about this system, though? Well, we know one more thing. We know that over this time of delta t, when we're accelerating, we actually are turning the engine on and we know that the engine applies a force on the rocket a force equal to f right now we're going to again assume that this force is constant throughout the the entire time uh, just not to not complicate things too much so we know that the rocket is experiencing a force equal to f right and if we know the force that the rocket is experiencing and we know the mass of the rocket we can also find the acceleration of the rocket. And that's going to be pretty easy. We know that the acceleration is going to be F divided by M, right? Because F, M, A, F equals MA, and you can basically rearrange for A. So A will be F divided by M. Now, we also know something else. We know what the acceleration is in terms of the velocities and in terms of the time. Because we know that the acceleration of the rocket will be equal to the change in velocity over the change in time, right? The change in velocity is basically just going to be the final velocity minus, minus the initial velocity, Vf minus Vi, and the change in time, well, will just be dt, or delta t, from right there. So now we have an expression for the acceleration, right? We have A equals F divided by M, but we also have A, the acceleration, equals to Vf minus Vi over T. And basically, it means that this bit here and this bit here are actually equal to each other. And from there, what you can do is you can let them be equal and you can rearrange the equation. And what you'll get out of this is basically that uh, F divide f delta t must be equal to m vf minus vi, right? But we have seen this term before, because that is basically just a change in velocity. And so combining this equation here and this equation right here, which sort of is almost falling off the paper, we can get the final result that the change in momentum, delta p, must be equal to f times delta t. And this is a very important result. What this equation is basically saying, delta p equals f delta t, is basically changing that the change in momentum of an object depends on the force that that object experiences and how long that object experiences the force for. And this is going to be an important equation later on when we're talking about 
our collision system and conservation of momentum. So now that we've talked about all that, let's consider the big question that we were after, right? About conservation of momentum. And let's consider momentum in some interaction between two objects, right? So suppose, again, we have the ball of paper and the packet of ketchup. And again, let's suppose the two objects are coming into each other, boop, and then colliding off each other. What we want to find is we want to find the momentum before the collision and then the momentum after the collision and then see what the total momentum is in those two cases. So let's actually consider the collision a little bit more carefully before we start, right? So what we can see happens is that the ball is coming in and towards the ketchup packet and what's happening is the two objects collide into each other, right? But you can see that the ball is initially coming into with some velocity and after the collision, the ball bounces off and it changes velocity. What this means is it means there must be acceleration going on, which means that the, this ball must be experiencing some force, right? And basically that force is coming from the packet of ketchup. When the collision happens, the packet of ketchup sort of exerts a force onto the ball in this direction, right? So the ball gets hit and then it experiences a force causing it to bounce off in the other direction. But by Newton's third law, we know that the exact same thing must also be happening to the packet of ketchup. The packet of ketchup is coming in and it's bouncing off and then going off in the opposite direction. Uh, acceleration is going on. So there must be a force experienced by this which is coming from the ball pushing against the packet of ketchup during the collision. So we can use those facts to consider what happens during our collision. So again, I'm gonna draw out the case that I was showing, but I'm gonna do it on the piece of paper, right? So suppose we have two objects colliding into each other. So let's say we have this block M1 and we have this other block M2, like so. Uh, M1 might just represent this roll of paper and M2 just represents uh, our packet of ketchup colliding into each other, right? And when they're colliding into each other, we say that this M1 will have some velocity of V1i, right? Uh, V1, velocity of the first object initially, and also the second object M2 will also have some velocity as well. I'm gonna say it's V2i, like so. Now we can work out what the momentum of uh, of the two objects before the collision will be. And I'm gonna call this PI for initial momentum. This initial momentum will be equal to P1I, or the momentum of the first object initially, plus P2I, the momentum of the second object initially. And we know what P1 and P2I will be because it's just gonna be momentum. So P1I will just be M1 V1 I plus the momentum of the second object would just be m2 v2 i like so. Now what happens during the collision? Well during the collision of the object what's happening is the object will well it will be hitting each other and there will be a force experienced by the two objects right. So the first object is going to experience a force actually use red first object is going to experience a force in maybe this direction right. And the force is going to have some magnitude, which I'm going to call F1, like so, right? But we also know from Newton's third law that the second object must also be experiencing another force as well. And that force is going to be, I'm going to call it F2, but we know that these two forces, F1 and F2, by Newton's third law, they must be opposite and equal in magnitude. Basically, what this means is that F2 must be equal to negative F1. Right, so we can see that F2 minus F, uh, F2 equals minus F1 means that the two objects have got the same, the two forces, sorry, have got the same magnitude, but it's in opposite directions, hence the negative sign, right? So this collision, this force will be applied for some time of delta T, again, using the same delta T as before. And well, we're gonna assume that this force during the collision is a constant throughout the entire time of the collision because that'll make our maths a bit easier. And so now the objects will collide into each other and they will be hitting for some amount of time before going apart in separate ways again, 
right? And when it goes upon separate ways, well, the first mass, m1, will now have a new velocity because there was a force applied onto it with a, this velocity v1f. And the second mass, m2, will also have some new velocity associated to it, which I'm going to say is v2f, right? Uh, this velocity of the second object, finally. Now, what I'm, I want to try to find is I want to try to find what the change in momentum of the two objects will be, right? Well, that's pretty easy to find. We can try to find that, right? So the change in momentum of the first object, P, uh, delta P1, will be equal to the final momentum of the first object, P1F, minus this final momentum, uh, the initial momentum of the first object, P1I. Right? But we know what this is, right? We know what delta P is from earlier. We know that delta P equals to F times delta T. Well, what is F in this case? Well, in this case, the F will be the force that is applied onto the first object, right? Because we're talking about the momentum of the first object. And that is going to be F1, right? And what is delta T? Well, delta t in this case is how long the collision goes on for, which is, well, just that delta t. So it's like that, right? So what we get is we see that the final velocity, p1f, will just be equal to p1i plus f1 delta t, like so. Now we can do something similar for the second object. Uh, I'm going to keep the picture in the frame there. Hopefully you can still see it. And you, you can. So similarly, we're going to have delta P2, the change in momentum of the second object. And that will be equal to P2F, the final momentum of the second object, minus P2I, or the initial momentum of the second object. But again, from before, you know what this change in momentum is. And it's basically going to be equal to F delta T again. But what is the F in this case now? Well, we're talking about the second object. So we look at the force that is experienced by the second object here, which is basically F2. So it's going to be F2 times delta T. Note that it's the same delta T because the two objects must be experiencing the force for the same amount of time. One object can't be colliding and experiencing a force for longer than the other object, right? The collision must be happening at the same time for both of the objects. So the delta T must be the same for the two objects as well. So we have F2 times delta T equals to this whole thing. But we know something else about the F2 as well. We know that F2 is actually equal to negative F1 by Newton's third law. So I can actually put that in. This will just be equal to negative F1 delta t. And we see we have this and we have this and we can work out what the final momentum of the second object will be. And we can see that P2F will be equal to P2I minus F1 delta t, like so. And a couple of people might already know where I'm going with this, but let's just keep going, right? So now we can work out what the final momentum is final total momentum, Pf, right? And Pf will just be the final momentum of the first object, P1f, plus the final momentum of the second object, P2f. Well, P1f, we have found right here, and P2f, we have got it right here. So we can just simply plug those in. P1f is just P1i plus F1 delta t. And P2f is just, well, p2i minus f1 delta t and you might see something really cool that we have f1 here and f1 delta t here as well and those two will in fact cancel each other out like such right and what you end up with we just end up with p1i plus p2i which is just the initial velocity from right there. So Pf equals to Pi, which means that the momentum before the collision, Pi, will be equal to the momentum after the collision, or Pf. 
And so, because of this, it means that for our collision, for this collision, the momentum must be conserved, which, well, basically that shows that momentum must be conserved in any interaction between two objects, which is really, really cool. So there we go. That is a simple way to show that momentum between two interactions must be conserved. Now, I realized that I made a couple of simplifications where, you know, I said that force uh, is to be treated as a constant and uh, the collision goes on for some delta t time. We assume a couple of things. That was just to keep the maths a little bit more simple. But you can very easily extend this into two or into three dimensions, like in real life. And there are, you know, slightly better treatments that you can also do to arrive at the same result. Uh, for example, you can use calculus, uh, which I'm going to link to in the description below. Uh, and you can also use more sophisticated. Uh, regimes of classical mechanics, like if you know about Lagrangian mechanics or Hamiltonian mechanics, uh, you can pretty much show the exact same result, that uh, momentum is a quantity that must be conserved. But uh, I, I did that about two years ago, and I'm not going to go back and, and check my check my notes or, or reread those contents to, to make a video about it. So uh, I guess you'll just have to do that in your own time. But anyways, that is it for my video on momentum today. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in and I'm going to hope to see you guys again sometime in the future, possibly. Yeah, I'll, I'll see. Momentum!